answer me. Of course. Um, so in your future uh, of everything podcast with the professor Russ Orkman, you spoke about how the core of American curriculum of reading, writing, and arithmetic should now be amended to include the fourth skill of coding. What makes you so passionate about computer science? Uh, in this amazing video I saw on YouTube, I saw that you compared studying computer science uh, now to being a geometer who was living in the time of Euclid. Could you tell us a, a bit more about why right now is the most exciting time to be a computer scientist? That's a good question. I think uh, computer science is exciting to me for two reasons. One is because it's a way of thinking. So in the same way that, for example, you know, people might study a particular subject, like we might study physics, it's not necessarily because we study physics because we need more physicists in the world. We do need some physicists, but that's not a reason for everyone to study physics. The reason why we study it is because it helps us understand the world. It helps us understand physically what's going on. It introduces a particular way of thinking to think about cause and effect. Um, and so it's a, it's a way of seeing the world. And I think of computer science as the same thing. It's not that everyone's going to be a software engineer or that everyone's going to be a coder, but there's particular processes in the, in the thought pattern and the thinking around computer science to think about how to take a big problem and break it down into smaller pieces, which are more manageable to deal with, to think about logical and systematic thinking, to be able to run through a process and understand where it would work and where it might fall down. Um, and so that notion of how to think logically and systematically and, and decomposing problems into smaller pieces, I think are really useful skills for anyone. Um, and they're really you know, fundamental to computing. And it gets me excited about it now because I think of, you know, computing is still, even though it seems like it's been around for a long time, is a relatively young field if you compare it to, say, mathematics or physics or chemistry. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So... In, in that sense, that's why it's like, you know, being at the early days of the field now, and there's opportunities to have lots of impact. Well, um, that's a really unique insight to have um, on computer science. But shifting on to you, Professor, you completed your PhD at Stanford in 1999. What was it like for you to be a computer science student at the very break of the internet? I mean, you literally helped create search. Um, Gen Z has all sorts of insane technologies to look up to when we decide that we want to pursue computer science. What was it that got you interested in the CS? Um, and more importantly, why do you feel the need to promote ethics and philosophy once you were in the ecosystem? You know, another great question. Um, there's lots of stuff packed in there. So uh, let me kind of start at the first part of the question and, and work through. Um, so, you know, in 1999, it was a really exciting time in, in computing, partly because it was it was around that time, a little earlier than that, around 1995, when the, um, you know, the World Wide Web came to public consciousness. There was a particular browser called Mosaic that was developed, and then that got commercialized into something called Netscape Navigator. And this was, you know, a few years before Microsoft got into the game. Um, but the availability of the internet, what was sort of, you know, people were still trying to figure out what was possible to do online. Um, if, you know, it's interesting to kind of think about that there, act, there were restrictions on commercial activity on the internet, and those actually got lifted, you know, in, by the end of the 90s. And so you got this huge increase in the amount of activity that was going on on the World Wide Web, because it became a lot easier for the average person to actually use the internet. You know, prior to that, you needed to have some level of computing skill uh, or understanding to be able to, there were still, you know, not websites, but there were other sites out there where you could get information for news or um, group postings or things like that. But really, the ease of use in the graphical interface you know, made the web accessible. Um, and it was exciting because you know, people didn't really know what direction it was going to go. They didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and, you know, I was in graduate school at the same time as, as Larry Page and Sergey Brin. We were all friends there, right? We just knew each other as students. Um, and, you know, Larry and Sergey in the early days when they were trying to get Google off the ground, um, you know, I'll tell you the story. They were trying to actually sell Google as a technology before they even formed the company. And they went to, you know, a few different companies, including, you know, Yahoo, and they were asking for $1 million with an M, right? That's what they were looking for, for the technology that eventually became Google. And they, everyone said no to them. 
And that's why they actually had to go form the company because they were like, we believe this technology actually has a lot of value. Other people don't see it. We need to go form the company to show them. And I think, you know, even they at the time had no idea that Google would become the large company that it became. But that was the thing, you know, many people just didn't see this. Uh, when Amazon.com uh, was getting off the ground, uh, a lot of people thought it would never become a profitable company. There was actually this joke in Silicon Valley that they should change their name to Amazon.org because they were a nonprofit, right? They were never, people never th thought they would make a profit. And now we can see, you know, how much that changed that a lot of people actually do buy stuff online. Um, but at the time it was not clear that that would be the case. And so it was exciting because it was kind of that opportunity to see this all unfolding and, and get involved with it. Um, you know, the first time actually uh, Larry and Sergey asked me to join Google, I said no, because I was like, well, good luck. You know, I hope it works out for you. I actually got a real job, you know, working at this other company. Um, and then it was, you know, a little while later that I was like, hey, <laughs> it would be fun to work there. Um, and then, you know, coming back to Stanford, it's been how long is it? Almost 15 years now that I actually came back to the university and have been teaching. Um, in the last few years, probably the last five years or so, is when my main interest in, in ethics really uh, took off. And part of the reason for that was for a long time, uh, technology was seen as, you know, mostly just a source of good, right? Like in the early days of Google, it had this motto, do no, or um, don't be evil. And, you know, the, it was amazing how much just positive reaction there was to the company, right? People had a very positive image of it. Well, in the last few years, that's really changed. And we've seen a lot of things happening and, you know, the spread of misinformation online. We've seen automation potentially displacing, you know, human jobs and human labor or changing the marketplace. So with like various kinds of uh, ride sharing apps, for example, um, people whose livelihood was previously in the transportation industry are seeing that changing now and it's it's enabled by technology. In some ways it's good, in some ways it's not so good. But a lot of times we, we see the, the main driver for many of these technologies being profit, right? That that's what companies want to do. They want to make more money. And so sometimes the needs of kind of, you know, broader humanity or society get downplayed, become, you know, second or third priorities to the or priority of profit. And so the focus on ethics was really one to say, you know, how do we think about uh, the development of technology in a way that really considers the needs of all people and that takes that into consideration with a higher primacy than just thinking about making money and profit. And so, you know, it's looking at, you know, the last couple of years I've been teaching a class actually with someone who's a philosopher um, and someone who's a political scientist. And then as the computer scientist, we look at these issues from different lenses. So we look at an issue like say, algorithmic decision-making. So more and more algorithms are used to make decisions about people. So we'll talk about the notion of, is that fair? And what is fair? And so there's a philosophical view of what is even fair, right? There's the computer science view of what can we try to optimize? What do algorithms try to do? And then there's the policy standpoint of what should they try to do maximize good for people? And we look at it from all these standpoints and try to figure out what's a better way forward than some of the things that are happening now. Awesome. I love how you, uh, how you tie in uh, psychology and behavioral science with uh, CS. It's super interesting. Um, but shifting gears a little bit, uh, I was personally very intrigued with the Code in Place initiative you and Chris Peach uh, launched last year. Um, for those of us who aren't familiar with the initiative, uh, the Code in Place program brought Stanford's legendary CS 106A class uh, to more than 10,000 students from 144 different countries. I read the Stanford Daily article about the program and I was quite frankly blown away. Um, I was especially interested to learn that the retention level uh, in the class was 10 times that of an, uh, a normal online MOOC class. Uh, and you had over 1,000 teachers conducting the program, uh, keeping a 10 to 1 student teacher ratio in an online class. Uh, so could you describe your experience teaching that class uh, and building that community? And what exactly does this experiment tell us about the future of CS education? Thanks for asking. Um... 
Yeah, you, both of you have really done your research really well. I have to say, it's it's just we're very interested in your work. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the idea behind Code in Place, and I give you know Chris Peach, who's, who's my colleague at Stanford, uh, a lot of the credit for this. Actually, most of the credit. I think he's he's just a wonderful human being to work with. Um, but at the the when the COVID pandemic was really starting to to take hold last March, um, the two of us were actually going to be teaching a class together, the introductory class, which is numbered CS 106A at Stanford. And we were talking on the phone about, you know, what can we do in the in the pandemic? And, you know, we said, well, we're not doctors in the sense of medical doctors, right? We don't, we can't, you know, actually work in a hospital. We don't have the means to produce personal protective equipment. You know, what do we know how to do? We know how to teach. When we figured there would be a lot of people who would be at home, you know, sheltering in place for the pandemic and that there would also be a lot of job displacement. So we thought, well, if people might have some extra time now anyway, because they have to be at home, and it, because there was going to be so much disruption to the economy, some people may actually be looking for different jobs. Why don't we try to create an educational initiative so we can try to help people learn about technology if they need to make a career change or just want to have, some, have something to do to have some time that's more productive um, you know, while they're sheltering at home. And so we decided, well, we're going to teach this class. Why not try to make it available to the world? But both of us, you know, as one of our areas of research, we research you know, online education, among other things. And we knew that you know, there were already some MOOCs out there, um, which are massive open online courses, and their completion rate is very low, which was disheartening, right? It's only around like 5%, something like that, of students who actually start a MOOC, finish a MOOC. And we thought, well, what makes classes successful? Like in our experience at Stanford, what makes our introductory class successful? And what it really is, is the human touch, right? It's the fact that every week you have their small groups meeting with a person who is the leader of the section, we call them section leaders. Um, and so students feel accountable that, you know, I, I want to get through the material because when I'm in that live section and we're having a discussion and question, I want to be prepared. Um, and at the same time, there's a person there who's leading the section who actually is paying attention to how well I'm doing and is there to help me. And so if I'm actually progressing in the class, they can help me continue to progress. If I, you know, don't make any progress, I'm just, first, I'm not going to be, you know, uh, being able to get the benefit of this education myself, but I'm also going to sort of be letting my section leader down because they have an expectation for me, like a teacher, to be able to so how do we get this to scale? Let's just try to get volunteers. And so this was a big experiment. We had no idea what was going to happen. We put out a call for section leaders, um, first at Stanford and then more broadly. And we had about 1,200 people sign up to do it. They, As part of the submission process, they have to submit a video and, and do some other things to show that they know the material. We actually had a small cadre of people who, you know, watched all the videos and did rankings and everything. And of that 1,200, we thought 900 were, you know, good enough to teach. And so we brought them into the program. And then we had a basically a little more than 10 to 1 ratio. So we were allowed to, uh, you know, we put out an application to students. We actually had about 50,000 students start the application, about 30,000 finish the application. And we were only able to take 10,000, um, but we still took 10,000 students and the completion rate was over 50%. So it was close to 60% of the students actually finished all the assignments in the class and went through the whole thing, um, which was really great to see. And then, you know, we did that once and we, we, it was such a positive experience, both for the instructors and, you know, what we did some surveys and the students told us they really liked it, that this year we said, let's do it again. So we're doing it again this year. We're actually in the middle of it right now. This time we have uh, 1,200 section leaders and we have 12,000 students. And um, actually uh, India, I think is, uh, could be the second largest country that we actually have students from. So there's a large number of students from India in code in place this time around. That's amazing to hear. Um, so kind of shifting gears uh, a little bit um, to a little bit of a more political question. Uh, now more than ever, we see a trade-off being made between social media's ability to support free speech, 
uh, and its ability to propagate hate speech uh, and incite violence. Uh, so the question to ask here is where exactly do we draw the line between allowing free expression of thought uh, and hate speech or to pry a bit more? Do you believe there is a computational way to determine the social impact of a post on social media before it has even been posted? Uh, and do you see this sort of virtual censorship being coded into major social media platforms after events such as the Capitol riots incited by tweets, tweets by uh, Trump? Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's a very interesting question. I think part of what it comes down to is what is the uh, local standard, my local, I mean, sort of, you know, within a particular country or within a particular state, what is their particular standard for what is allowable speech? And the situation right now is basically, if you think of places like, say, Facebook as an example, uh, Facebook, in some sense, has the governance power of its own country, of being its own country, actually being larger than any single country on the planet, given that there's over 2 billion sort of monthly Facebook users. Um, if it were a country, it would be this country on the planet. And the question is, who is the, the ruler of that country, right? It's basically Mark Zuckerberg. So he gets to make the decisions as to who has free speech and who doesn't have free speech, who, um, you know, in, in, in what ways people can post information and where that line exists. And so if you think of that, a role that's traditionally taken by government, which is to determine what is hate speech, what are the, you know, allowable rules for free speech within a given country, are essentially now controlled by a single individual. And, and there's a few caveats in there, so I'll give you the caveats in just a bit. But you know, what we're seeing in sort of the consolidation of power in the large platforms is not just a consolidation of technical power, but that technical power turns into political power when they have an, an impact on these kinds of decisions for a large body of people. And so the you know, caveats, for example, in Facebook's case is at, at one level, they don't actually want that power because they're actually in the strange situation where they get criticized from both sides, right? If they do something to take down content, they get criticized for censorship. And if they leave content up that is hateful in nature, they get criticized for allowing hate speech. And so in some sense, um, you know, there's, there are arguments that they take from both sides. And so they, you know, at some point they said, well, you know, we don't really want this power. It's unclear how much they completely don't want it, but they actually do want some broader input. There is now this you know, council, which is sort of referred to as the Facebook Supreme Court, which actually makes some of these decisions, but they only handle about you know, 20 decisions every three months, every quarter. So the number of real decisions they need to make are, is actually pretty small because it's just a group of 15 people who make these decisions who are pulled in from you know, different parts of the world and different kinds of backgrounds. But they also take up some pretty important decisions. So uh, later this month, actually, they're supposed to be ruling on whether or not Trump gets his account back on Facebook, right? So Facebook made the decision to close his account, but the Supreme Court, this external body could actually reverse it, which will be a pretty substantial decision in that case, given the number of you know, followers he has on that platform. So the real question becomes, okay, so how should this be regulated, right? Because what you don't want is you don't want a private company having complete control to regulate this. The notion of free speech should really be controlled by the citizens in a particular country or in a particular state. So, you know, even though politics has its own problems and has its own, you know, issues, it still is, at least as far as we have now, kind of the best mechanism for being able to collectively determine what is the decision-making will of the people, at least in places where there's some level of democratic rule, right? So no one person can make that decision. How do you sort of collectively adjudicate or determine among what people want? Well, if you have a you know, somewhat democratic process, that's kind of the best mechanism we have for it now. It doesn't solve all the problems. I'm not saying you know, that doesn't have its own issues, it does, but at least it's a way to allow for collective decision-making. And so then the country determines what are the particular guidelines that they wanna have around free speech, and that's what the platform should be required to follow. Um, in some places, they actually are because of rules. So, for example, in Germany, they already have rules against, you know, 
uh, speech related to uh, Nazi background or Nazi history. Um, and so the platforms actually have to abide by those right now in Germany, otherwise they wouldn't be allowed to operate there. And so for different countries, you could think there's, there's different rules that they have. The place that runs into problems is some countries actually don't have democratic rule and they have authoritarian regimes that say, you can't post anything that is critical of the government, right? And then that's the place where this raises this question of that's not representing the will of the people because the people had no collective decision-making and there are some rule that's preventing the government from being or preventing the platform from being critical of the government, what are the rights of citizens to a free flow of information there? And that's the place it becomes difficult because when companies try to do that, the governments can kick them out, right? And this is kind of the situation we actually saw with Google in China. They went into China in the hope that, you know, potentially they could make more information available. And the response of the Chinese government was you actually have to censor the results Otherwise, you can't do business here. And so Google doesn't do business in China anymore, at least not with respect to search in that way. Well, um, I mean, um, you, you spoke about Facebook. Um, Facebook has 2.7 billion users right now. They're a massive juggernaut. And um, I think this brings us on to privacy a little bit because Instagram recently stated that they'd be using a billion public images to train AI. Um, the sheer lack of personal privacy on the internet is really shocking because every company tracks quite literally every move. Um, but interestingly, some of the products and services that we relish the most are a result of such tracking. At what point does this tracking become excessive or unethical, even if the goal is to solely design a better system? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And there's, there's lots of, you know, uh, issues in the answer. It's actually one of the topics we spend a lot of time talking about in this, this ethics class that I teach is, is the notion of privacy. And one of the interesting questions that comes up is, you know, what is the value of privacy, right? Because sometimes, sometimes people take the view on privacy of, well, you know, you just shouldn't do anything that you wouldn't want to become public, right? If you don't do anything bad, then there's no problem with privacy. And what that really raises the question is, you know, in terms of individuals' entitlement to privacy, what is the value of privacy? And the value of privacy really comes down to the value, of, you know, in my mind, and I think for a lot of other people, personal autonomy, right? So think of it this way. If, if someone had no privacy at all, would you make different decisions than you make now? If you would make different decisions, then what that means is that privacy is valuable to you as an individual, as an autonomous person, to be able to make your own decisions. And so if you take some of that autonomy away from the individual, that philosophically as a value is you're taking away something that makes that individual who they actually are. Right. So in a very deep sense, privacy as a value, even if someone were to argue, well, if you just don't make those decisions, right, everything's fine. It says, well, what you're actually doing is you're taking away that some level of that person's autonomy. And now, so if you think about, you know, issues like facial recognition or other data that platforms gather to be able to optimize their platform, the question is, where is the line for what data should be gatherable? And the, if you look at globally how different regions of the world deal with this, it's actually pretty different. So in the United States, for example, it's very, uh, the regulation are very lax. Basically, the, there's a framework called no defined consent. So if you've ever been to a website, right, where they have this huge terms of service that you agree to, the notion is they have now notified you of their privacy policy. And when you click okay, because you want to use the app, you have given consent. And more or less, they can pretty much do whatever they want with your data and collect whatever data they want. So there's very few regulation, right? The, the law basically says you need to be informed. That doesn't mean you have to actually read the policy, right? Most people don't. They come in there, they get 20 pages of stuff. They say, well, I want to use this app. They just click OK and they move on. But from the standpoint of the law, that clicking OK is you given consent and you can do whatever you want. And if you actually read the Facebook terms of service, there are some things in there that if someone actually were to read all the details are actually fairly frightening, right? So when you post a pic picture, for example, to Facebook, you actually give them a right to do anything they want with that picture, right? So they can take your picture, 
turn it into a political advertisement, right? And put a picture of like whatever candidate you hate next to yours and say, you know, this is how you should be voting because this is what, you know, the people want. And you might see that and you say, but, but that's my picture with this person I hate. Why are you doing that? And it's because, well, guess what? When you click that button, you gave them consent. A diff different framework that's used for privacy is what we've seen actually in the last year or two, a couple of years actually in Europe, which is called the general data regulation, sorry, uh, the general data regulation, GDPR, sorry, data protection regulation. Um, and the idea is that it's supposed to put a lot more of the control around data in users' hands. So not just notifying consent, but the notion of if you actually want your data pulled from a system, you should be able to do that. There should be clear guidelines with things like how long a, a platform is going to keep your data before they delete it. Um, there's also some re you know, side effects that you might find annoying, right? So now when you go to a lot of websites, it actually asks like you to okay their cookie policy, right? If you've noticed that. For a lot of websites, that's actually due to GDPR um, because it actually says if you are tracking the person, they need to be notified, right? So if you're using cookies, they need to be notified. Um, and it's an interesting framework. So in more places that same notion of giving individual users more over there now beginning to kind of take hold. So there's uh, a law that just passed in California and the United States that has some similarities to GDPR. There are some other countries that are looking at similar kinds of regulation. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what you know happens on a on a more global level. But it is, you know, again, it comes from the notion that individual countries have different sorts of frameworks for how they do things. Um, in the United States, there's an, ex you know, they're actually sort of on the extreme on the notion of free speech. And that translates to also kind of freedom for the companies to do what they want to do with data. Um, and since many of them are based in the United States, they've had, they've sort of been doing more with that data than people might actually with but i think sort of framework action that we find that um the consumers definitely don't have much autonomy on on the, on the data collection these big tech companies have i posted an image on twitter which i'm not too proud of and now if you google my name it's everywhere and it, it just doesn't go down um but adding a bit more to privacy and where data collection but where, where one can draw a line on data collection i like to add some context to this entire question with respect to the startup i'm working on so um so, so i'll just give you a brief intro on the startup um we are we aim at curbing the sizing issue on fashion industry and then boosting online sales and hyper 3d person laptop and and due to our approach and outlook behind this entire issue we have the opportunity to collect unique data parameters that link to personalization. And we essentially, um, we're, I mean, we're hopefully waiting on collecting millions of individual body data samples, which is something very personal and collecting this form of data, um, some may classify as being intrusive. Um, but creating supreme personalization is what we envision and creating new technologies requires us. Um, what sort of feedback or advice would you have for organizations like ours, where one might have to balance between collecting user data and offering a better service. Yeah, it's it's a great point. And part of it is, um, you know, to what extent do you meaningfully inform your user about what data you're collecting, right? So it's not just buried inside, you know, 20 pages of a terms of service agreement, but really they become aware of what data you're collecting, how you're going to use that data, right? So what kind of guidelines do you give yourself to say, these are places where we can use the data in a particular way, and these are places where we're not going to use the data? Do you also make a clear policy around things like aging your data out, right? So like after 18 months or something, unless you want us to keep the data longer than that because it has some benefits to you. So for example, if it's a you know, fashion application, someone's, you know, things like their shirt size, their waist size, things like that, that they might use for clothing. They might want to say, well, if I'm regularly engaging with the application, it's fine for you to have that information. And so you can keep it for longer than... 18 months, or you can keep it as long as I keep logged into the application, right? And then if it's 18 months past my last login, then you should delete it. Um, 
but it's it's also letting them know what that data is being used for, right? So if the data is just being used to um, find the right clothing for them in the right sizes when they log in and it's not used for anything else, that's, you know, and they agree to that, that seems perfectly reasonable. There are certain things where you might want to think of, well, are there ways where aggregating this data becomes useful? So one thing is aggregating people's preferences. What did they buy, right? So you can recommend other things to them. That's kind of the common case. Um, well, how much data are you collecting and how is it being used in aggregate? And then are you sharing that data or selling that data to other platforms? Right? Are you allowing other people to now target individuals based on that data? So one of the you know, big issues, for example, for advertising companies, um, you know, and there's many, but the Googles and Facebooks of the world is basically what they're allowing is other people to pay money, the advertisers basically to pay money to be able to target the users of those platforms based on the data that those users gave to those platforms, not because they wanted to get ads, but because they wanted to get a better experience for the particular information on that platform, like friend recommendations or more personalized feedback in search results, right? But it's not like I gave my data to Google because I want advertisers to be able to target me. They have my data because I want better search results for when I do a search, right? But I don't have control over that. And so to the extent that you can give people actually that kind of control or just make kind of the statements that we're not going to make this data available for use by others like advertisers or whatever the case may be, then you're drawing the lines for, you know, making it clear where that data is being used and where it's not. And I think that's kind of the, the bigger issue is that right now it's not clear to an individual user, right? When you go to Google and you use their application, you don't know what data is being collected about you. You don't know who has access to it or how it can be used, right? In any meaningful way. Um, you also don't know how long they keep it, right? I mean, most people who don't actually bother to read through all the terms of service don't realize, you know, how that data, what is the longevity of how they keep it, what kind of models are built on it, stuff like that. So that's what needs to be clear. And you want to think about the, you know, keeping the user centrally in mind. To what extent is the data you have available, potentially data that the user doesn't want you to keep around to personalize, you know, even if it's for personalization, because it crosses some line into violation of their privacy. That sums it up pretty well. That's insane advice. That's what we'll be doing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so kind of on this idea of coding, um, as a CS student, I am completely new to coding. Uh, I know the most fundamental structures of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, not much really, uh, but I've read several of your studies on modeling how students learn how to program uh, and autonomously generating hints by in inferring problem solving. So that uh, idea of an intelligent tutor. Um, given how important CS is in today's world and the influx of new students wanting to learn how to code, such as me, how do you see beginners like me learning coding the right way, uh, if there even is one? Yeah, there's lots of different places to start. And I think the, the biggest step is not so much worrying about learning how to code the right way. It's just about taking the first step. Like I think for most people, the fact that you are already, you know, taking your first step or taking have gone past your first steps clearly in, in terms of coding um, is the most important thing, right? The hardest thing for anyone is just to start something new. Um, and so I do have, you know, particular thoughts around the right things people should learn when they're coding. Like I think about, um, you know, coding is kind of like writing in the sense that just knowing words doesn't make you a good writer. There are certain principles of being a good writer, right? Like you have a thesis statement and how do you make your argument compelling? And how do you convince someone of a particular point by structuring evidence together and having a narrative in your writing? These are all the things we sort of write as we learn or we learn as we do more and more writing to be able to create better writing. Um, but just having a dictionary available to us of all the words doesn't make us a good writer. And that's the same way I think about programming. And you know, you can learn a programming language by learning all the words in the language, basically, like what are all the commands you can use? 
but that by itself doesn't actually make you a good software engineer. What makes you a good software engineer is understanding what are the principles for writing good software. How is it structured? How is it uh, something that's readable by a person so that it can be maintained over time? How are big problems broken down into smaller problems so the different portions of the code can be reused to build something bigger and more robust and improved over time? So, you know, I do think that's kind of a long term goal for someone who wants to be a software engineer. But the short term goal is really just to get started because if you never start, you never become a software engineer. Right. And and that hump of just starting is the the bigger challenge. So I do think, you know, some of the, the ways that you can learn the, the proper ways of coding is once you get started, once you actually get over the hump of like writing your first programs and, and making some progress that way is to try to find programs that actually emphasize principles of software engineering or what we like to refer to as programming methodology. That's the name of the course that you know I teach with Chris Peach. Um, that's more than just the notion of like, you know, how to code in 20 days, right? There are lots of books that are like, learn JavaScript in 20 days. And those are kind of more interested in teaching you kind of the dictionary, right? Is here are all the commands you can use. Um, and it's a little harder to find the, you know, how to become a software engineer in four years, right? Because actually becoming a good software engineer is something that takes a lot longer than 20 days, right? If someone came along and said, how to be the world's you know, greatest writer in 20 days, you'd probably say, well, it turns out the craft of writing is something that takes a longer time to really be able to hone. Software engineering is the same thing. But there are you know, programs that kind of take a longer term view toward doing that. And those are the ones that in the long term, I think are worth seeking out. But getting started, like get started with anything because the, the getting started gives you that impetus and gives you that power to then be able to take the next steps. Yeah, so speaking about getting started, um, I'm deeply interested in the role computer science plays uh, in democratizing access to transformative information. Um, this is why at Mahatma, I work on, uh, like I mentioned, Theratunes, uh, which democratizes access to music therapy. Uh, and it's built especially for students with special needs. Um, working with special needs centers across India, I learned uh, how to build a rudimentary app. Um, and with your permission, I'd like to show you uh, a bit of the beta version of it. Um, would that be okay? Sure. Okay. Uh, Manu, I think uh, you're going to share your screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes. Uh, all, all right. right. So this is the kind of front page. Um, ignore the kind of a pretentious uh, image of me. Uh, but uh, so these are the volumes of music therapy. Um, so everything here has been coded from scratch uh, with the help of Manu, of course. Um, so what Manu is doing right now, he's scrolling through some of the songs we've made. Um, so these songs employ structures um, uh, such as uh, specific frequencies, drones, um, research factors that help students to express themselves uh, emotionally, socially, and cognitively. Um, there are obviously the lyrics of these songs. So Manu, if you could click on this first song. Uh, so here you've got this kind of cool animation. So the audio, uh, I think there's a kind of filter on it, but uh, you can play this song. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the computer version of it. Uh, what Manu just clicked on here are different filters that you can play with the song um, that change the way it sounds. Um, And so if we move on to the lyrics page, um, click on this arrow over here. So uh, beneath this lyrics button, we have a small kind of introduction. Uh, so what exactly this song is, uh, so, and over here we have lyrics. So uh, like I mentioned, this is a teacher training app. Uh, before this, what we would do with our small team um, of instructors, we'd go out to these NGOs and we'd sit with teachers and teach them how to effectively build lesson plans uh, and administer these different songs. Uh, each song uh, regards a different topic. So fine motor skills, cognitive thinking, a uh, uh, call and response, things that special needs uh, students uh, uh, use for uh, everyday in their everyday lives. Uh, and so once we had to move this to a virtual platform, uh, we had to kind of think about how exactly would we teach teachers 
um, effectively. So if you see this, we've got lyrics and next to each kind of uh, stanza of lyric, you have these question marks. Uh, and when we click on these question marks, there are these notes for the instructor. So here, as it says, you step, uh, start with tapping your thighs, uh, and then you encourage to sit in a big circle while singing this song. So these are small kind of notes that we've uh, quoted in. Uh, and then obviously at the bottom, we have these cool kind of icons to tell you, okay, what this song, what skill is it going to develop in your students? And why is that important? And the thought of description of the skills. And then finally, you have these suggested uh, instruments, a little audio clip. Um, but that's, that's essentially what we have right now. Uh, we're preparing to pitch it uh, to a pretty big NGO in India. Um, we're excited uh, to launch this and moving forward, we're definitely going to make some changes. Uh, but it's just nice, it's nice to share with someone who has so much knowledge on computer science. Um, and as a beginner, I definitely want to uh, improve this. So as I continue to work on Theratunes, could you tell us about the most exciting CS4 social impact projects you have personally seen? Well, first of all, congratulations on Theratunes. That's really nice work. Um, and one of the things also that that I just you know loved about what you were saying is how you were talking about you know a lot of the thought behind this came from sitting with teachers right in terms of you know, pre pandemic both you know talking to people but also understanding what were some of the needs and I think that's something that is is hugely powerful a lot of times you know people will go off and write software without thinking about who the users are or without sort of getting that sort of feedback really into the application. And so it, it's great, I think, both in terms of what you're trying to accomplish with the application and the process you're going through to build it is just is fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate that, yeah. Really nice work. Um, in terms of the, probably the most exciting project, um, I would so well, it's, it's hard to, to break some things down because like in the early days of Google, that was pretty exciting because, um, you know, honestly, in the early days, you know, none of us knew how big of a company it would become or how many people would use the application. Really, our goal was just, you know, how do we make it easier to find things on the web to be able to navigate the space and to get people the information they're looking for? And so seeing it grow over time, like how much it got used and the different ways it got used um, was really exciting. It was very exciting. It was also kind of scary sometimes, um, but it was pretty uh, exciting. Um, so that was kind of the you know most exciting kind of larger, longer term project. Um, I would say sort of in terms of more personal projects, you know, that I've been directly involved in, it could be, you know, maybe the recency of it, but code in place, um, I've just found to be an extremely positive experience. Um, we get, and part of it is because we get a lot of direct feedback from the students. We get, you know, students who write to us and tell us, you know, I lost my job. And now because of this class, I have found a new job where I have an entree into the world of technology. Um, I, we even had one person who wrote us there just this really heartfelt note um, about how they were really depressed and, you know, they were considering suicide and the basically engaging with the class was something that got them to think more positively and, and not do that. Um, and it was really kind of shocking, right, to read that, that you would think that, you know, this is education can do that, but I think education has a, has a tremendous sort of life transforming power to it. And so, you know, those are the things I find most exciting is where it actually seems to have an impact in people's lives. And when you hear it from people, right, that's just, you know, there's, to me, there's no more excitement than that, that when you really can have a positive experience with your positive. Impact For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's really interesting because you've seen Google Google grow from nothing to the tech movement it is today. I mean, you've been in the Valley for decades now. You've worked with legends. You've taught and groomed legends. And most, and we most clearly understand you being a legend, an absolute legend yourself. You've been there. You've done that. We want to know what the next phone is going to be. Computers were the next thing when you were growing. And you've seen mobile phones literally sprout out to nothing and become everything now. What's the next thing coming into the 2020s? I mean, Facebook is dedicating 50,000 employees just to AR and VR, 50,000. What will the future bring to us? 
Yeah, I think that's the future. I mean, it is certainly an exciting time to be in computing. I think one of the things that we'll see, you know, more of, and I think, you know, it's also being heavily motivated by the pandemic that we're currently in, is we're going to see more use of computing in healthcare applications, both in trying to improve and understand what kind of you know, medical care or medical interventions actually have the most impact to try to be able to improve medical care. Um, but also in the development of therapies, there's a lot of work going on right now in terms of being able to uh, essentially design better drugs, better therapies for people using the power of modeling and, and machine learning to understand sort of what candidate drugs are most likely to have an impact. Um, or being able to understand the sort of patterns of how certain kinds of drugs work to be able to create other ones. Um, but I think, you know, that, that notion of using computing as a way to be able to prolong human lifespan in some sense has a lot of tremendous potential. I do think there's also a lot of potential in the uh, ability to use technology to scale education. Um, education traditionally has been a very labor intensive uh, field, right? It, it sort of scales with the number of people who are teachers. Um, but I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind is you don't want technology to displace the teacher, right? There's something about human contact in education that technology can't capture in the same way. But what technology could potentially do is better empower teachers to understand what and how their students are learning so they can improve the learning experiences for their students. So that's where I see the real impact, right, of modeling and machine learning is to help the teacher understand, like, where are the places my students have problems? How do they have problems? Why do they have problems? And so how can I be more effective as a teacher to help them over, overcome those problems so that they can make more progress in their education? That's so, that's so wonderful to hear, uh, Professor. Um, so I have a little bit of a uh, lighter mooded question. Um, in your classes, when did you decide that you will start using a lightsaber as a pointer? <laughs> and what made you want to throw candies at students who ask questions? I found this very interesting. Uh, and we demand an origin story. <laughs> that's a great question. I actually have a lightsaber right here since you asked, because you oh. just got to keep them handy. Um, but it's also sure. when, when, you know, we closed down uh, Stanford for, for in-person instruction, you know, and I was taking some things home from the office, I had to take the lightsaber with me. So when I teach remotely, I can still use it. Um, but the way I really think about it is, um, you know, part of the power of teaching in person, I mean, now we live kind of in a world, right, where things are more mediated by screens. Um, but part of that power is how do you really get students to engage? How do you get them to try to pay more attention to what's going on? And so I think of education as having sort of a performance aspect to it, right? It's kind of like, well, why do people go watch movies? Because the movies are entertaining, right? They tell a story. They get people to want to watch them. It's like, okay, so how could we make education more like that? How could we make it funny or engaging or, you know, create a level of anticipation where people want to know what the answer is rather than feeling like, okay, I'm just sitting there like waiting to get through the next hour. And so part of that is finding different ways to engage, right? There's the lightsaber prevent, uh, provides sort of a level of, of humor and engagement in the class. So does throwing candy, right? Throwing candy means you got to be alert because there's this thing that's getting thrown out into the audience and you probably don't want to get hit by it. But it also gives you a reward for engaging, right? So if you ask questions, if you're involved, there are some kind of recognition or reward for that kind of in the moment. Um, and so there's little things like that, which is really the goal of trying to make teaching more engaging and giving students more of a reason to want to be involved and pay attention. Um, and, and that's something that I think is, is, I wouldn't say, you know, I know all the right answers. I'd say it's over time is something I'm continuously trying to improve um, and figuring out ways that we can make the experience better for students because there is, you know, if you look at the educational research, there's a lot of research that shows that things like uh, engagement, active learning, where students are really trying to think through the solutions to problems while they're 
uh, involved in educational activity is much more effective than kind of just, just the traditional like lecture model. Like I'm just going to talk for an hour and that's all that's going to happen. Um, so we're trying to draw out those questions, trying to create inter, uh, interactive experiences where students get involved in the process of trying to solve a problem, um, you know, leads to better educational outcomes. And so lightsabers and candy are just part of that. So that's super unique. Love it. Yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah, I'd actually I'd like, like to ask a follow-up question to this because we've seen multiple um, ed tech companies in India and internationally add some form of a cartoonish reinforcement, which 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 may um, which may act as a substitute to engagement. Right? We see companies um, add cartoon characters towards education platforms, and and you get small prizes and you get small tokens that encourage students to learn. Do you see that form of reinforcement actually working out? especially to the level you're expecting it to in terms of personal connection. Yeah, I think it has a lot of potential, right? Like most things, it's kind of how well it's done. Sometimes they're not done very well. Sometimes they can be done really well. But I think people are oftentimes motivated. And the, you know, research kind of bears this out. People are motivated by small rewards. Um, and so if there's like badges you can get or there's achievements you can accomplish or certain things, you know, when someone, you know, this is one of the things that they've actually seen a lot of uh, fitness technology, right? Where it's like, oh, try to take 10,000 steps today with your Fitbit or whatever. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, I'm at 8,000. I'm going to go for a walk so I can get to 10,000, right? And if they never had this achievement to unlock at 10,000, they wouldn't have taken those extra steps. But they're motivated to do it because we are driven by little rewards. That's just, you know, how we're, you know, biologically kind of built. And so in terms of, you know, sometimes the, they refer to them as nudges. In things of nudges you can do to get people to engage in more healthy behavior or more education, those are great things to do. The flip side of that is there's also lots of ways that people can be nudged to engage in behavior that is not very healthy, right? And so sometimes you see this in various platforms, like I want to get you to watch another movie or another, you know, clip on YouTube or whatever the case may be. Um, so we are also very prone to nudges and that kind of behavior, but it may not be the best activity for us. So when you were speaking about nudge, are you referring about the, the book? Um, Cause I know there is a book called Nudge uh, and that probably kind of follows that. Very interesting. Yeah, um, it's a good point. I mean, it's a lot of the things that are sort of in that book are, are in the same vein. Um, and, but they, they, they have lots of examples that are not necessarily technologically focused, just like, you know, course, yeah. how do you make something like the default behavior? And if you make it the default behavior, most people just adopt the default, so they'll just do it. Um, technology has a sense, it has a potential to be a little bit more proactive. Um, sometimes it comes under the moniker of what people refer to as persuasive technologies. Um, but there was, you know, many years ago, I think this was probably about 15, 20 years ago, um, and maybe even a little bit more than that. There was a professor at Stanford who was teaching a class kind of in the early days of persuasive technology. And this is when like mobile apps were just beginning to take off. And so one of the assignments in the class was to use some of the techniques of persuasive technology to build a mobile app. And there was a student just as a class project, you know, and the idea was, okay, and then try to release your apps if you can. He just did this as like a two or three week class project, but because the techniques for persuasive technology were so powerful and they had not been, you know, fully exploited at that time. Now they're used a lot more often. Um, this class project he did end up being becoming this app that was generating something like $10,000 a month in revenue from like a two week project that he did. Right. And people were like, oh my God, you know, that, a lot of people woke up to understand like just how persuasive these technologies can be. Um, a lot of those techniques are used more commonly now. So they're not quite as persuasive as they were in the days when, you know, just a few apps were using them, but it does sort of show how much you can influence human behavior by, by understanding some of these techniques. All right, uh, thank you for that. Um, and as a kind of final question, uh, what are the craziest pranks you've witnessed at either Stanford or Google, uh, if there are any? Um, 
there's there's some that are that are pretty fun. There's actually one that started as as a prank and actually turned into a real thing, which was you know uh, when Google was growing really quickly. At some point, we no longer had enough space for people to have private offices. So everyone was going to have shared offices, and they were sort of cramming lots of people into different offices. Um, and Eric Schmidt, who was the CEO of Google at the time, there were one of the engineers. Uh, his name was Amit Patel. Um, just one day comes into Eric's office and sets up his computer in there and his keyboard. And he says, well, you know, if you say we should have shared offices, we should share an office too. And so I'm going to be your office mate. And so Eric at first was like, what's going on? Like, I'm the CEO of this company. Why is this guy just coming in here and setting up his computer? And the next day, Amit came back and that was, he sat there all day and that was his office. And the next day, he did it again. The next day, he did it again. And for something like four years, Eric and Amit shared an office at Google. And at first, Eric thought it was like the weirdest thing. Like, why is there this random engineer in my office? And then he realized that because Amit was there and Amit actually worked on the, the data engineering team, right? So he was like doing log processing, all this stuff. He was this tremendous source of information. So anytime Eric wanted to know a question, like how many queries did we get yesterday? which you know uh verticals or which sectors are the places that are actually we're getting the most queries or advertising the most he could just ask amit and amit would just be able to give him the answer immediately and so this thing that started as a prank actually turned into like no there's actually real value in doing this even for the ceo so that was kind of one of the fun stories you know there are some other ones too but that one actually you know most people find pretty interesting that it was just this engineer that decided he wanted to sit with the ceo and the ceo realized there was actually a lot of value in that i love that Mirad. there are you know, five more minutes for some audience questions sure okay uh Arav, over to you can you hear us i know you have a question uh, yeah i can so yeah, so recently with the ex exponential increase of COVID cases in India, a variety of NGOs have been using no code to build applications to access like COVID resources. I've personally been, been a part of some of those teams. And this is just one example of how no code has already begun to display its prowess, right? Do you believe no code could be the next step in, in empowering the common man to create code for the greater good? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, certainly that direction, I think, has a lot of power. Um, yeah, there's a notion of, you know, what is the particular technology that you actually use to do that? But I think there is more of a push toward getting more people to understand how they can actually make things without having to go and learn a whole bunch of programming and, and be able to put applications together. It's sort of we move up the stack of abstraction in some sense in technology. So I think there's a lot of uh, potential power there because the power of computing is really unleashed when you move the compute the consumer to be a producer, right? It's like most of us are used to just consuming technology, right? Other people build apps that we use. And when you can take the average person and turn them from being a consumer into a producer, you now unleash the power of many more people in terms of, you know, what's possible with technology. The, the difficulty there is the people essentially who are building those abstractions, who are building things like no code, what are the affordances or what are the mechanisms they're giving to people to be able to build things? Because that sort of constrains the set of stuff they can build. And so that's the question is, if we want to sort of, uh, in some sense, you know, the notion of democratizing technology to make it really available to everyone, part of the question becomes, what do we want everyone to have the power to do? And how do we build that out in a broad way? Um, so I do think there's a lot of potential there. I think it'll take a little while before we achieve that potential. But part of it is always keeping in mind, like, what are the kinds of things you want to empower people to do? Those are the sorts of things that, you know, should be prioritized in terms of the technology we build. I love that. Thank you so much for your time, Mehran. Any other final audience questions that, that jump out and they'd say, but I really, really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. Um, and thank you so much for well, making Well, thank time you for, for the us. opportunity to be here. This was just, and, it's just lovely to hear about the kinds of things that, that are going. And the questions were just, you know, extremely well thought out. So thanks all for, these two. for taking the so, time. Really, really appreciate your time. Thank you, so much, thank you so much, Professor Thank you so much. It was really thanks. fun chat. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Have a lovely, lovely day. Thank you so much. Thank you.
You too. Good to see Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll stop recording. <laughs>